Pranam Dar, pal. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Professor Bruce Vanstone, and I'm the head of the Bangor Business School. It's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to the Chartered Banker MBA Celebratory event. And I need to let you know that this event is being recorded so that all of those people who couldn't make it at this time can enjoy it later on. So thank you for coming. Uh, we're holding this informal event today to recognize all those who have completed the CBMBA program in the summer 2021 and winter 21 cohorts. Uh, all being well, it's anticipated that graduates from 2020, 2021 and 2022 will be invited to participate in a face-to-face -face graduation ceremony that will be held across a three-week period at Bangor University. We will, of course, keep everyone informed as we get more certainty around that event. So this afternoon, we're here to celebrate our graduate achievements. There are awards to be presented for the best overall graduate and the best in professional ethics. In fact, we have quite an exciting agenda planned. We're honored to have a keynote presentation on green and sustainable finance from Simon Thompson, the Chief Executive of the Chartered Banker Institute. We'll also be addressed by Steve Pateman, the President of the Chartered Banker Institute, and Professor Stephen Jones, the Academic Director of the Bangor University Chartered Banker MBA. I'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about the Bangor University Chartered MBA program. As you probably already know, the Chartered Banker MBA, or CBMBA, is the only program in the world that can combine both the coveted Chartered Banker status awarded by the Chartered Banker Institute, together with the academic rigor of an MBA program from the Bangor Business School. Bangor Business School is ideally placed to offer this attractive program in partnership with the Chartered Banker Institute. Bangor University itself has a long history in banking education. In fact, Bangor University can trace its roots in banking education as far back as 1902. Bangor Business School has an outstanding reputation in teaching and research. From a teaching perspective, the current Sunday Times League tables rank Bangor University in the top 10 in the UK for teaching quality and student satisfaction. From a research perspective, in 2021, RIPAC organization ranked Bangor Business School as the highest ranked academic institution in the UK based on the quality of its banking research. The Chartered Banker MBA program is now in its 11th year. We have more than a thousand graduates and students on the Chartered Banker MBA program coming from close to 100 countries worldwide. And a 2021 graduating cohort contains 97 graduates from more than 25 different countries. So firstly, let me offer my congratulations to the graduates. You have joined an exclusive club of global professionals. You have reached the gold standard for professionals working in a banking sector. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Simon Thompson. Simon Thompson is the Chief Executive of the Chartered Banker Institute. By any standard, Simon has guided, Simon has had a very impressive career to date. Under his leadership, Simon has guided the Chartered Banker Institute since 2007. Simon has led the transformation of the oldest institute of bankers in the world into an international standard setter for socially purposeful, responsible banking and placed it at the heart of the global ecosystem to enhance and sustain professional lifelong learning in banking and finance. Simon has worked with governments, central banks, financial regulators, national banking institutes, and a range of academic partners to improve the ethics, culture, and conduct in banking, and to support the growth of green and sustainable finance. Simon is a recognized authority on sustainable finance and responsible banking. He's the author of the book, Green and Sustainable Finance, Principles and Practice, released in 2020. You can get your copy on Amazon. Simon is the chair of the Cross-Sector Climate Risk Syllabus Panel, the chair of the UK government uh, established Green Finance Education Charter. So please join me in welcoming Simon to our virtual stage to present his keynote address on aligning the financial sector with sustainability. Thank you, Simon. Well, thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and first and foremost, congratulations to all 97 Chartered Bank MBA graduates. We're recognising this afternoon, uh, and I hope uh, we will get to meet many of you face to face together with some previous graduates who have not had the chance to meet face to face uh, very soon too. Congratulations on becoming chartered bankers with the world's oldest institute of bankers, the Chartered Banker Institute, and on gaining your MBAs from and becoming alumni of, as Bruce mentioned, one of the UK's leading universities 
one of the world's leading banking universities too, which continues to go from strength to strength in its global leadership in both research and teaching, as not least the Chartered Bank MBA program itself demonstrates. So I hope you know all about the university's proud reputation for banking. Um, having studied with Bruce, Stephen, John and, and colleagues at Bangor over the past couple of years. But did you know, and this takes me on to the subject I've been asked to talk about this afternoon, that Bangor was uh, just a few months ago ranked the 15th most sustainable university in the world and at the same time also ranked first class in the People and Planet University rankings for its commitment to sustainability within its own operations and also for promoting sustainability in its teaching, research and business activities. And just as being green and sustainable is a competitive advantage for universities, so is being green and sustainable, often expressed in terms of making a commitment to achieve net emissions uh, by net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest, a competitive advantage for businesses in so many sectors. I would probably suggest almost all sectors these days. And that's true for banking and financial services as well. And it's something that I firmly believe is already shaping and will continue to shape the future of financial services worldwide. And that means it will shape your future careers as the leaders of banks and financial services firms for many years to come. In fact, alongside digital and data driven finance, which you'll have studied you know, during the MBA, um, sustainable finance, by which I mean how we align banking and finance with the objectives of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and with wider aspects of sustainability, such as those set out in the UN Principles for Responsible Banking, Principles for Responsible Investment and the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. This will shape all of our futures and the futures of the institutions we work for and we, we lead. Now, aligning banking and finance with the objectives of, of Paris was one of the key themes at COP26, the UN Climate Summit, which is hosted in Scotland, where I am today, just about three months ago. And I was lucky enough to be there on behalf of the Chartered Banker Institute. So like many, I, I think I would summarise COP26 overall, that it achieved more than was expected, but less than is needed. So that is good progress was achieved in encouraging countries, especially many of the, the major emitters of greenhouse gases, to be more ambitious in terms of their climate action plans. But in many respects, key details were lacking and the pace of government climate action is in most cases insufficient to keep global warming to less than two degrees above pre-industrial levels by mid-century. But it's not just up to governments and intergovernmental organisations to tackle the global issue of climate change. Banking and finance have a really key role to play too. And I say this partly because it's it's our sector and our profession, my sector and, and my profession, but mainly because it's actually set out in the Paris Agreement itself. Now, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change has three objectives. And the first is fairly widely known. I hope you're all aware of it. It's to limit global warming to below two degrees and ideally to as close to one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels as possible. The second Paris Agreement objective is also fairly widely known to promote climate resilient development, to make individuals, communities and countries better able to withstand the impacts of climate change. And, you know, given the global reach of the Chartered Banker MBA, I know that sort of that's uh, of, of real um, importance uh, and timely for many of our, our students, our alumni, our members who work in countries that will feel the, the direct impacts of climate change much more uh, uh, intensively and more rapidly than we will do in the UK. But the third of three Paris Agreement objectives is not so well known and yet it's critical to achieving the first two objectives. Article 2.1c requires countries to make flows of finance consistent with lower greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development. And I think it's very telling that the Global Climate Change Agreement singles out the critical role of finance, our critical role. And as the world overall and countries one by one do adopt more ambitious, in many cases, statutory and binding net zero targets, then finance, so banking, investment, insurance, accounting, every aspect of finance will be expected and in many cases required to play a leading role in the transition of energy, transport, agriculture, 
buildings, production, consumption, in fact, every economic activity, every economic entity to sustainable low or zero carbon models. This isn't just about identifying and investing as early as you can in the next Tesla. The key role and the real opportunity for, for, for banking, particularly lending banks and bankers, is in financing the transition of existing high carbon firms and sectors to sustainable low carbon business models and technologies. It's financing through the transition that's key. And it's some of these opportunities that I'd like to focus on today because as, as current and future leaders in banking, you should be identifying and pursuing these to deliver sustainable returns to your investors and shareholders and also delivering positive social returns to your communities and your other stakeholders too. So here's, here's the good news on climate change. We know what we need to do to tackle the climate challenge in terms of the mitigation, the adaptation that's required. We have the technologies we need to transition to net zero by 2050, although many need to be substantially scaled up, such as carbon capture and storage. And we know how much it will cost to achieve the transition. Uh, different estimates are given, but the estimate I find plausible is around about $6 trillion a year, according to the G20, for the next 15 to, to 20 years. So perhaps some 90 to $100 trillion overall. Now these are eye-watering sums, the equivalent of the annual expenditure on the Apollo program, plus post-World War II European reconstruction combined. But we do have the capital required, largely holding savings balances around the world, especially in Southeast Asia. So at one level, this is all very simple. All we have to do is make sure banking and financial services does what we're supposed to do best, transforming savings balances into the investments we need, in this case, in sustainable technologies and infrastructure, and that transition of existing high carbon business models to sustainable low carbon alternatives. Whatever the precise cost of that transition, the scale of investment means that public funds won't be sufficient. In fact, it's estimated some 80% of the funds need to come from private finance, hence the excitement and interest in this area from leading financial institutions and investors worldwide. Now, as I mentioned earlier, almost every economic entity needs to transition, but the pathway for each sector, and in many cases for each organisation within each sector, will be different. There isn't always a simple template that can be used. What's needed are banks and bankers with a deep knowledge of the businesses they lend to, banks and bankers who are trusted advisors to their customers, to their business communities, highly trained, highly skilled bankers, just like all of our Chartered Bank MBA graduates. Your customers, your communities will need your advice, your expertise, your finance, increasingly so to help them move to more sustainable, low carbon business models and invest in cleaner technology production and distribution. So this is partly about developing a knowledge of green and sustainable finance, of climate change, of transition pathways, of science-based targets, but it's actually more a knowledge of banking, of finance and of lending that's really needed to support this, much more than a deep knowledge of climate change and sustainability itself. Because the great majority of the products and services that support the climate transition are the products and services that experienced bankers are already familiar with, just with an added sustainability wrap. Increasing demand from companies and institutional and retail investors for sustainable investment and lending products and services create opportunities for the banks and bankers that can capture these. So just to give some examples, you know, at the large corporate end of the market, a green bond or one of the many emerging types of sustainability, SDG, sustainability link bonds, are simply bonds from a financial perspective, albeit ones that seek a sustainability return alongside a financial return. Uh, the, at the moment, the United States via Fannie Mae, the mortgage agency, has been the, sig the biggest single issue of green bonds for some years now. I think this year uh, it'll be overtaken for the first time by the EU, which has plans for up to 250 billion euros of issue. But in fact, the corporate green and sustainable bond market is growing and growing fast in many parts of the world. And quite interestingly, there's now evidence in Europe of an emerging greenium that's making corporate treasury system take notes. In other words, green bonds are now pricing more competitively than their vanilla equivalents, as demand is higher from institutions and investors keen to decarbonize or at least tilt their portfolios more towards green. And in the mid-tier, green loans are simply loans that seek an environmentally positive impact and require disclosure and verification of this. 
I mean, of course, there are some extra costs and complexities involved in issuing green loans around disclosure and verification and the documentation and the contracts required and so on. But as the market grows, the costs continue to come down to a point where, at least here in the UK, green loans are themselves now priced at or often below the price of, of a vanilla equivalent, you know, sometimes reflecting some subsidy, but very often perhaps reflecting a lower credit risk and again the desire of institutions to green their lending portfolios. And a one area we're seeing develop in the UK and in Europe in particular at the moment is what are referred to as sustainability linked loans, by which I mean lending that isn't just green or to something that is seen as green or clean, but lending that seeks to incentivize improving sustainability of informants. So that transition, it could, it could be environmental performance, it could be social performance, it could be a mixture through margin enhancements, through lower covenants or through other incentives if agreed sustainability targets are met during the tenor of the loan. In other words, these are great products for supporting that transition to more sustainable business models rather than simply lending to a company that has a new technology that is green. And last year saw very substantial growth in the sustainability linked loan market known as SLLs, uh, including what's currently the world's largest SLL, a $10 billion revolving credit facility for a uh, AB InBev led by ING Bank in the Netherlands. And in fact, European banks such as ING and BAP Paribas are amongst the innovators and leaders in these areas and well worth looking at. On the retail banking side, um, there are many opportunities too. We're seeing the rapid development now of green mortgages. In the UK, we now have some 31 green mortgage products in the market, according to the Green Finance Institute, up from just a handful this time last year. And again, as with commercial lending, a green mortgage isn't hugely different to a standard mortgage. The main difference is usually a slightly reduced interest rate where the discount relates to a property's energy efficiency. The theory here being that the more energy efficient a home, the lower the utility bills, the higher the proportion of income available to service the loan and hence default risk is reduced. Of course, when mortgage rates are very low, as they are in the UK and many parts of the world at the moment, discounts are not huge, but could become more significant if or perhaps when rates rise more substantially than they have recently and with inflation at 7% in the US, nearly 6% now in the UK, probably not that far away. Also in terms of, of housing and reducing emissions from housing, uh, we're seeing the development of financing to support the retrofitting of property to make it more energy efficient, which is a particular problem for countries like the UK, where if you've had the chance to visit Bangor um, and you've seen the area around the university, some of the Victorian terraces and so on, you'll see we have many beautiful houses and buildings, but they're very old. They've got very drafty doors, windows and walls coupled with antiquated heating systems, meaning that some 20% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions come from the property sector. Um, technically, it's perfectly possible to retrofit most buildings. The problem is it's expensive. So replacing gas heating with heat pumps or hydrogen, even for a small family house, the cost in the UK is around £20,000 on average. Significant savings in energy costs should accrue, however, especially now with higher energy costs uh, already going up and on the horizon. So it's a great idea for financial innovation or great area of financial innovation if the savings can support repayments of a loan for capital expenditure and generate returns for both lenders and borrowers over that period. It's not quite as simple as that, and it's fair to say that no one has really cracked this market yet, although a great deal of thought and effort is going into it. So perhaps this could be an, an area where there's an opportunity for bright and entrepreneurial MBA graduates with a good knowledge of banking, if you happen to know anybody who might fit that criteria. And this kind of general model, financing higher capital expenditure to be repaid through lower operating expenditure, can support the further development of the electric car market, other clean and green technologies with substantial upfront costs, followed by low running costs. And in fact, this basic model financing CapEx through OPEX savings lies behind much of green and sustainable finance, whether that's at the retail level or at the wholesale level, the construction and operation of wind farms or solar farms. So these are just some examples of the kinds of opportunities out there for banks and bankers in supporting customers and communities transitions to a more sustainable low carbon world. But alongside the commercial opportunities, there is for me a compelling moral case too. 
supporting the transition to net zero and a more sustainable world in general are opportunities for our banking and finance profession to demonstrate the positive social purpose we have and it will help us continue to reconnect banks and society. So by doing what we do best, connecting savings with investment, in this case investment in lower greenhouse gas emissions and climate resilient development, banks and bankers really can help to save the world. We can, and I would contend we must, to set out in the Paris Agreement, play a leading role helping individuals, communities, countries, and the world as a whole transition to a more sustainable, low carbon model creating at the same time shared and genuinely sustainable prosperity for current and future generations. And if we can successfully combine the environmental and the moral imperatives with the commercial opportunities, then I think we create a very dynamic and hopefully unstoppable force within finance to tackle climate change. But banking and the world needs new leaders able to rapidly seize the opportunities that this presents. And that's where I'm convinced some of the very best opportunities lie for you, our Chartered Banker MBA graduates. You have the opportunity to make a very substantial difference and to make the world a much better place for your colleagues, for your customers, for your families and your friends. So good luck and remember as you do that, that your institute, the Chartered Banker Institute, together with our colleagues at Bangor University, will be here to support you as you go out to shape a stronger banking profession and I very much hope a more sustainable world too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. That was a great presentation uh, with a particular timely sustainability message for all of us. And thank you again for helping future bankers to identify future sustainability responsibilities and opportunities. Um, so well done. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Steve Pateman to give the vote of thanks. So Steve Pateman is the president of the Chartered Bankers Institute. <coughs> Steve has worked in banking for over 40 years. He sits on the advisory board of the Aurora Group and Kingsley Healthcare and was previously on the financial capability board of the Money Advice Service. During Steve's banking career, he has held a number of impressive positions. Steve was CEO of the Hodge Banking and Life Insurance Business and Shawbrook Bank. He led the UK banking businesses of of Santander UK, sitting on the UK board of the holding company and various UK subsidiaries. He also represented Santander on the board of its US businesses. Prior to joining Santander, Steve spent eight years at RBS, where he was CEO of Business Banking, Retail Markets, and Managing Director of Commercial Banking and Corporate Banking, Corporate Markets. Please join me in welcoming Steve to give the vote of thanks. Many thanks, um, Bruce, for that, that great introduction. Um, and many thanks to everybody who's joining us today um, for this for this ceremony. Um, it gives me great pleasure on behalf of the Chartered Institute to uh, offer the vote of thanks. As president of the Chartered Banker Institute, um, the oldest institute of bankers in the world, I'm here primarily to congratulate all those of you who have graduated today, 95 of you across 24 countries, which is a tremendous uh, achievement on the on the on the part of, of Bangor. Um, it's a tremendous achievement on your part becoming Chartered Bankers MBAs and on becoming, for those of you who weren't already members, members of the oldest and most prestigious Institute of Bankers in the world. These figures demonstrate the global approach, the global appeal of not just the Chartered Banker designation, but also Bangor University as an academic institution. I know we and the team in Edinburgh are extremely proud to have been able to assist our first centre of excellence partner through such difficult and challenging times over the last two and a half years, whilst at the same time supporting our 33,000 members across 100 countries and six continents. I hope that you're all very proud of what you've achieved today. You certainly should be. As the values espoused by our members underline, now is quite rightly the time for our institute to continue to, to help banking play its part in supporting the economic and social recovery and changes that will flow from COVID-19. The events of the last two years have taught us a lot about responsibility, whether that's adapting to changes in how and where we work or how we serve our customers, how we work with the communities we operate in and the wider needs of a society brought together whilst physically apart. 
Stewardship is a word that our founders would have used almost 150 years ago. Today, we might say responsible and sustainable. And that's why we define a responsible banker as someone doing the right thing in the interests of society and for their customers. And as we look ahead over the next few years, the key theme running through all that we do at the Institute, from our qualifications and learning, our member benefits, our services, our events, will be geared around that concept of responsible banking, helping the world economy and society to try and rebuild in a better way from the effects of the pandemic. Responsible banking, as Simon says, needs to be led by professional bankers such as yourselves. And we need to ensure that the future of banking is one that reflects and celebrates the diversity of our world. We live in a global community and it's absolutely right that we look outwards and face into the challenges that arise from COVID-19 and some of the economic challenges it presents, as well as climate change. And the roles that bankers can play in meeting these unprecedented challenges, not just to our sector, but also to the world in which we and our families live. I can remember becoming a chartered banker and the professional pride it created for me and my family after years of work. To that end, I know how you all feel today, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to our profession. You are chartered bankers, which brings with it both privilege and responsibility. You have much to be proud of as individuals, so I encourage you to use your chartered banker designation whenever you can. So to close, congratulations once again on your achievements. Please do all you can to promote and inspire others to adopt the ideals and values of the Chartered Banker Institute and live by the Chartered Banker Code of Conduct throughout your careers. Before I hand it over to Stephen to make the presentations, I'd just like to thank on behalf of the Institute, Professor Bruce Vanston, the head of Bangor Business School, Stephen Jones, who leads the academic director of, for the MBA program, Lisa Jones and Sinead Hughes from the university, and of course, the team in Edinburgh at the Chartered Banker Institute, and actually these days, pretty much uh, not just Edinburgh, but where they happen to live, for all they've done to support this online graduation event and all they've done to support this programme over the last two years. And most importantly, my final set of thanks and congratulations go to you and new graduates and to your families and friends for the support that I'm sure they've given you along the way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, for delivering the vote of thanks. Like you, we're very proud of our new CBMBA graduates, and we're also very proud of the relationship that the Bangor Business School has with the Chartered Banker Institute. I'd now like to introduce Professor Stephen Jones. Professor Stephen Jones is a Chartered Banker MBA Academic Director. He's been involved in the program since, since its inception 11 years ago uh, as a Module Director for Marketing Strategy for Financial Services. Stephen's passionate about the development of professional competencies, and is supported by theoretical insights for students, executives, and businesses. Building on his prior senior management experience in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and China, Stephen introduced the ideas of teaching entrepreneurship and e-business at Bangor. He is the school's director of business relations, and he's a member of the steering group for our leadership projects, uh, in particular, the Ion Leadership Project, which is accredited by the Institute of Leadership and Management. Stephen teaches undergraduates, postgraduates, and post-experience modules, and his involvement in executive education extends back to 1995. As well as the UK, Stephen has taught in Dubai, Hong Kong, India, Ireland, Italy, Jamaica, Latvia, Malaysia, Singapore, South Africa, USA, and Zimbabwe. Fantastic. So please join me in welcoming Stephen to our virtual stage. Hello everybody. Many congratulations on your success. I first want to uh, extend my own congratulations to you all, the 2021 Chartered Banker MBA graduates. But it's not just congratulations from me, it's also from uh, all the academic and admin team who've worked with you throughout your studies. You've persevered in your studies and overcome many challenges, not least of which have been the COVID situation effects. You've balanced your studies with work, family responsibilities, which 
previous cohorts of graduates have also done, but you've had the added challenge of studying, learning, being assessed and balancing the COVID situation. But as we celebrate your own individual success, uh, I also want to congratulate and thank your family, as Steve Paintman just did, your friends, our partner institutions around the world, not just CBI, but also in, in many geographic locations and other networks who I know have encouraged you and supported you during your studies. Both Bruce and Simon have mentioned Bangor's positions in some rankings uh, globally for teaching, for research and for sustainability. It may interest you to know that the CBMBA programme itself has played a part in achieving those objectives. Bruce mentioned that we started the programme some 11 years ago. When that started, it was very much a paper based programme. Hard copy core texts, paper based accompanying study guides, conventional examinations taken in physical examination centres around the world. On average, about 50 examination centres each sitting of exams. We'd already commenced moving away from some of these more traditional uh, but less uh, environmentally friendly methods, uh, e-textbooks, study guides that were online, but the COVID situation accelerated our activities and operations just as I know it did uh, your own operations where you work. We've reduced by over 300 packages the books that are shipped around to students and also we've reduced the printing and shipping of exam papers uh, to uh, examination centres as we've moved to online exams. But that's quite enough about your alumnus, the uh, your alma mater rather, the Bangor University of which we've spoken so far. Now let's focus on your success. First of all, I'd like to confirm the awards to students who graduated in 2020. So if we're able to move to the slides for the, here we go, the student awards. Applause indeed. So the awards for 2020. In the July 2020 graduates, Denise Subaran, who's from Jamaica, was awarded the best overall student performance. And at the same uh, graduation uh, event we awarded to Delia Cox who's from St Kitts and Nevis we awarded the best student performance in professional ethics and regulation something which is at the heart of the Chartered Banker Institute's concept of the responsible banker as well as sustainability looking to the future uh, appreciating the impact of digital aspects of operating but also ethical banking. So those are the ones for 2020. Um, July, we move on to 2020 December and the best overall student Valerie Bakham from the UK, from Scotland uh, specifically, uh, was awarded the best overall students performance and then for uh, best performance in professional ethics and regulation, Misty Dorman Hussein, who's from Trinidad and Tobago. I was about to say that all of those uh, countries of origin that I've just mentioned have probably got far warmer weather than we have here in Bangor at the moment, uh, but perhaps not in Scotland. Uh, we're not here to, uh, uh, to compare temperatures. The snow on the mountains, or there has been recently around Bangor. The picture behind me is not actually of Bangor, but uh, it would be great in the events which we're planning in 2022, when there will be three weeks of graduation. Physically, we're hoping uh, if some of you are able to join us. Now, moving on to our 2021 awards. Uh, for the July 2021 exam board, the award for best overall student goes to Cicely Johnson, who's from the Bahamas. Well done, Cicely. And for 
professional ethics and regulation. Best student performance goes to Christy Bala, who's from Mauritius. In, I can hear. Yeah, OK, if you can just mute yourself so that uh, there's no crosstalk. Um, so we've just congratulated Christy moving on to the 2021 December uh, exam board. The best overall student performance in this graduate group is Yasin Subani. Also, I'm advised from Mauritius. And then the best performance in professional ethics and regulation goes for December 2021 to Haja Yusuf, who's from Brunei. You can see in the uh, awards and uh, countries of origin that uh, this is truly a global uh, global program. Uh, we had the tagline in the 10th anniversary celebrations of one program, 10 years, 100 countries and 1,000 students. Well, now we have more than 1,000 graduates, I should say, more than 1,000 graduates. And uh, the best performing students come from all over the world. So uh, you have all of you, whether you um, are, I believe there are some uh, potential applicants for the next intake. Uh, geogra geography is no limitation. It's all about you setting your own expectations and going for uh, going for best performance. Now then, congratulations, as I've said, are due to you, to your networks, your families that supported you, and to our partner institutions. But in making some closing comments, and I think the screen you can see at the moment um, refers to keeping in touch. I'll say a little more about that in a moment. But um, Bruce referred to banking at Bangor University going back to 1902. And uh, even I wasn't around in 1902, despite what you might think. Um, so there's nobody here who can uh, attest to what we were doing in 1902. But the business school has run a um, series of lectures attributed to um, a banker from 1885. So it goes back even further. In 1885, the banker George Ray printed the first edition of The Country Banker. At that time, the subtitle for the book, it wasn't a textbook, it was just based on 40 years of George Ray's own experience. And it talked about his clients, cares and work. That was the subtitle. So in making closing comments, I want to again congratulate you all, but also to emphasize that this event has tried to capture how banking financial services have evolved over the last century or more. George Ray in 1885 focused on his clients. None of us, be it the university, the institute, or uh, any of you uh, working in financial service companies will survive without focusing on our clients, our customers. But these days our clients and customers, as Simon suggested, are much broader. And perhaps these days we talk about stakeholders. And stakeholders, as you know, uh, from your studies are much broader than just shareholders. Stakeholders, particularly when we make decisions that affect the environment, uh, affect many people who we wouldn't conventionally see as customers of our organisation. But we need to think much broader in terms of stakeholders. The cares, the cares of George Ray in 1885 were to an extent largely commercial. Uh, for the banks that he'd worked for. Now, of course, we have commercial concerns, all of us, but we need to think in a much broader dimension as Simon has encouraged us to do so. The work that we're engaged in uh, has changed dramatically. Even in the period of your studies, it's changed from doing many things physically, although all organisations were beginning to move towards 
um, the use of online services in many ways. Uh, a famous quote talks about accelerating the pace of that change. So in drawing things to a close uh, and to the uh, slide which is in front of you, keep in touch. It's about the um, four aspects that the CBI has been encouraging its membership to focus on as responsible bankers, being ethical, being behaving in a sustainable manner, thinking about the future, not just about how we got to where we are, but also the future and recognizing the benefits, the requirements to behave in a um, digital manner to achieve those overlapping objectives, ethical, sustainable and future aspects of being a banker. So it's about keeping in touch. What are you going to do as graduates now that you no longer have to study for the CBMBA? You've got some spare time. I'm sure you first of all take a deep breath, uh, a deep a sigh of relief and a deep breath. Your family and friends uh, are pleased to have more of your time, but things continue to change. As Alvin Toffler, the futurologist has said, the only constant is change. The only constant is change. Nothing stands still, nor should our own thinking on these matters. So in encouraging you to keep in touch, I want to highlight the slide there, which talks about the um, connections you can have to the chartered banker through a variety of digital forms there, uh, Facebook, Twitter, etc. But also it um, mentions about building links, maintaining your links to your professional institute, your professional association, the Chartered Banker Institute, represented today by Simon and Steve. You need to visit their page on a regular basis, their website. They have thought leadership sections, which will be invaluable for helping you to keep up to date with what's coming along, what we ought to be thinking about, what are the future trends, etc. You'll see in the middle of this slide, it talks about providing uh, the Chartered Banker Institute membership, providing access to a wide range of support, further training courses, professional advice, privilege invitations, etc. So do keep in touch with your alma mater, Bangor University. We'd love to hear from you uh, and hear how things are going for you. Uh, I encourage you to think about um, contributing and giving back, giving forward as the phrase is these days to your own geographies, your own um, employer and your colleagues there, but also to your own communities. So I think uh, that's probably more than enough from me. Suffice it to say that although the recording will finish um, after my final words, the area will stay open for you to extend congratulations to each other, the group of students, so that um, it will in some small way attempt to reproduce what we would do with a physical um, coming together of a graduation. If you are joining this ceremony because you are interested, uh, you are not yet a graduate, but uh, you are a guest interested in achieving the benefits of a, a world-class MBA and a chartered banker status from the world's oldest banking institute, the CBI. There are a couple of links you can get in touch with to find out about how you could benefit from the programme. Finally, many congratulations. As we say in Welsh, and all good wishes for the future. Uh, keep in touch. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye, everybody.